Right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Green New Deal Explained, uh, Limiting Climate Chaos and Tackling Economic Inequality. Um, this webinar is presented by the SSU Earth Days Planning Committee in conjunction with the Geography and Sustainability Department. We have three fantastic panelists here today to present on the Green New Deal and offer their experience perspectives on climate crisis solutions. Uh, for our agenda, we'll have about a half hour for presentations and then about a half hour at the end for a Q&A portion. Uh, this webinar will also be recorded for future use. Uh, now let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Joey Wallengevich. I'm a junior here at Salem State. I study environmental sustainability in the geography and sustainability department, and I study public policy with the political science department. I'm really passionate about climate crisis work. I've worked with the Sunrise Movement for the past two years on Green New Deal. So I'm very acquainted with the topic and very excited to be with you here today. Um, so, we're gonna talk about voting at the end. Um, so please remember throughout this whole uh, panel that we will be talking with the election in mind and uh, keep that at the forefront of your thought. Um, so now let me introduce the panelists. Um, so our first panelist is Professor Noel Healy. Noel Healy is an associate professor in the Geography and Sustainability Department at Salem State University. Dr. Healy works at the intersection of rapid climate mitigation, fossil fuel politics, just transitions and climate equity. He's a contributing author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report, and he sits on the editorial board for Energy Research and Social Science. Dr. Healy is also the co-author of the recent article, The Green New Deal in the, the US, What It Is and How to Pay For It. Welcome, Dr. Healy. Um, our next panelist is Alyssa Battistoni. Um, Dr. Battistoni is an environmental fellow at Harvard University. She is a political theorist working at the intersection between environmental politics, political economy, and feminist thought. She is also an associate faculty member at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research and co-author of the fantastic book, A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal. We are so excited to have you here, Dr. Battistoni. Um, and our final panelist is uh, Avi Chomsky. Dr. Chomsky is a historian who has taught at Salem State University since 1997. She has published numerous books on immigration, the Cuban Revolution, labor history, and the impact of extractivism and economic development in Colombia and globally. Her current research focuses on the social and environmental impact of coal mining and indigenous resistance in Colombia. Welcome, Professor Chomsky. Thank you. Um, all right, so the format. So each panelist is going to have about eight to 10 minutes to speak. And after everyone is done, we're gonna to move to the Q&A portion, which will feature roundtable questions and, and discussion on specific parts of the Green New Deal and more. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Noel Healy. So Professor, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Joy. And thanks for everyone for joining. Um, so my opening comments are going to be divided into three parts. Um, first, I'll give an overview of the climate emergency. Second, I'll discuss why responses to climate have failed thus far. And third, I'll explain some key components of the Green New Deal and discuss why the Green New Deal is necessary. So the first reason, so climate change, this is why we're all here. The IPCC has outlined the magnitude of ongoing and future threats, extreme weather events, sea level rise, increased frequency and severity of droughts, floods and wildfires, the breakdown of food systems and mass human migration, something that concerns me deeply. If you just look at the climate related events over the last few weeks, California's wildfires have already scorched 4 million acres of land, more than twice the previous record. Scientists didn't expect wildfires this terrible for 30 years. Sadly, those least responsible for historical emissions will get hit hardest and fastest. So climate change is an existential threat and it's a threat multiplier for instability in some of the world's most volatile regions. But how can we limit climate chaos and, and what can we do? So, the first point is that global net CO2 emissions must fall by 45% by 2030, and they must reach net zero emissions by 2050. So what does this mean? Well, within a decade, we have to almost cut emissions by half. That's around 7.6% pollution cut every year. To put this in context, despite global efforts, emissions have risen every year for the last three years. And while there was approximately 8.8% decrease in global emissions in the first six months of 2020 due to the COVID lockdowns, these emissions are rebounding as economies opened. So this is exactly why the IPC stated that we must immediately institute rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. 
So this means reconstituting not only our electri electrical grid, our agricultural systems, our financial systems, our transportation systems, trade and manufacturing, land use, political systems, military, the entire economy. And this is why when AOC or a Ed Markey, uh, or this is why they are, AOC and Ed Markey are scientifically accurate when they say the age of incrementalism is over and now is the moment to think big and to take bold and urgent action. So a little bit of context of why we have failed thus far and why the Green New Deal um, opens up all these opportunities. For the first part, um, for over three decades, some of the world's largest fossil fuel companies have collaborated to deceive the public, um, manufacture pseudoscience and propaganda, and literally have bought public, uh, public support to block policies to curb emissions and fossil fuel use. Related to this, for nearly three decades, governments have been trying to find climate solutions that do not clash with free market orthodoxies of deregulation, privatization, uh, low taxes for the rich and public austerity. The mainstream economic solutions to climate change are carbon centric approaches. So what I mean by this is carbon taxes and emission trading schemes or narrow regulations focus on polluters. Energy transitions that narrowly focus on carbon reduction won't address endemic inequality or energy poverty. These carbon centric approaches disproportionately impact lower income families who spend a large share of their incomes on fuel for public transportation and will invariably generate backlash. So for example, the Yellow Vest protests in France, the 2019 mass public uh, uh, or public revolt in Chile, uprisings in Ecuador and Haiti were sparked by fuel taxes, rises in public transportation costs and cuts to fossil fuel or cuts to fuel subsidies. So a Green New Deal should be grounded in a just transition framework, uh, one which provides a suit of climate policies which have redistributive outcomes such as the Green New Deal's job guarantee. So that's some of the background. Uh, so now what is a Green New Deal and, and why is it necessary? Well, the Green New Deal is a 10-year economic mobilization plan to rapidly transition the US to zero carbon economy, while at the same time significantly reducing inequality in, in, uh, and addressing legacies of systematic oppression. Um, despite what you might hear, it is the reasonable pragmatic response to the climate crisis. It aims to achieve net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions through a fair and just transition for communities and workers. Uh, to create millions of good high wage jobs and ensure prosperity for all people of the United States. Um, the Green New Deal is perhaps thought of as a governing agenda that guides every aspect of public policy making and Vershini from Sunrise Movement has been very clear on this. Importantly though it should not be seen as one single piece of legislation but rather a roadmap for a broad spectrum of policies programs, legislation, and executive actions that can be introduced by various US representatives and senators over the coming decade. A Green New Deal effectively rejects mainstream neoliberal economics. Its economic rationale is based on the adoption, on the adoption of a Keynesian uh, demand side economic, economics of the type utilized by President FDR to revitalize the US economy during the Great Depression of the 1930s. In the midst of a pandemic and a climate emergency, we desperately need policies that match the nature, the scale and urgency of these crises. A Green New Deal, if done right, can establish urgent public health and economic safety nets to protect the most vulnerable and to stave off dangerous climate, climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Healy. Um, our next speaker is going to be Alyssa. So you can go ahead when you're ready. Great. Um, well, thank you, uh, Joey, for the introduction and for the very kind words on the book. Um, and it's it's great to be here with Noel and Avi, and I'm looking forward to talking about all of this. And Noel um, set, uh, set me up really well because I wanted to um, sort of take it from there and um, uh, just explain a little bit about what we were, um, my, me and my co-authors, um, Kate Aronoff, Danielle Donna Cohen, and Thea Rio Francos, um, were thinking about we wrote our book, um, um, Making the Case for a Green New Deal and what we call a Radical Green New Deal. 
um, in that book, which we which came out a little uh, just under a year ago. <laughs> it's obviously been quite a year. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is just sort of say a little bit about what sort of um, what what our what was our impetus for writing the book at the time, what we were hoping to do, and what I think um, sort of remains uh, relevant, and what we can take from it in this moment. And I know um, I won't go into that fully because we'll probably talk about that more in questions. Um, but basically, uh, we we wanted to sort of um, we were excited uh, when we saw the Green New Deal resolution last February because it really did seem to be a break with um, the sort of neoliberal consensus around a carbon tax that Noel described um, and, a, and a shift towards a different way of thinking about climate change and um, the kind of problem is and how the kinds of solutions we need. Um, and so we really wanted to build on that and, and make um, sort of flesh out in more detail um, what uh, a Green New Deal and a Green New Deal from the left would look like since, you know, that the resolution really sort of sparked a lot of discussion. Um, we were worried at the time about uh, sort of the co-optation of the Green New Deal framework. <laughs> that seems like less of a, a threat now that, you know, you see Joe Biden and um, debates like saying, oh, I'm not affiliated with the Green New Deal, you know, so there's, there's obviously sort of a, a changing I think it's been a very shifting political calculus around how people choose to identify whether or not the Green New Deal. But in any case, we wanted to sort of flesh out a vision of what we thought it could be and needed to be. Um, and I think in addition to what Noel said um, uh, very well about what it's trying to do, what the Green New Deal is trying to do, I think we really wanted to emphasize the political aspect of it, that um, climate change has been treated as a sort of technocratic issue for a long time, something that either economists sort of like come up with a carbon tax um, or energy experts, um, you know, it's, a, it's either a technical problem that you need a technological solution to or um, some sort of minor policy tweaks. And instead, we really, we do think that climate change is really embedded in sort of all of everyday life and we, so we need to tackle it there. But that means you need to sort of, you can't just sneak it past people and have like the, this existential crisis um, gets fixed with like a couple of weird tricks that nobody notices. That's that's always been this like real, I think, gap in the, the rhetoric around climate change and then the proposed solutions. And so we really wanted to, um, to, to sort of face head on what it means um, to tackle an existential threat um, and to do that in ways that aren't just like lecturing people about how they need to, um, you know, sacrifice and tighten their belts when uh, many people have been doing that for a long time um, as economic inequality widens, um, both in this country and in other parts of the world. Um, but to say actually a Green New Deal can, can actually make people's lives better, it can deliver on um, everything from, you know, jobs to public housing, to public transportation, things that people need um, and that can make their lives get better um, in low carbon ways. Um, and so we wanted to outline what that would look like and, and how we could actually build political support um, and popular support for something like the Green New Deal rather than treating climate change as something that you have to like, um, to which um, people are an obstacle. Um, so that was sort of the impetus. And, and I'll just say really briefly some of the areas, obviously the Green New Deal, um, I think as Noel rightly says, is, is a framework. It's not like a piece of legislation um, and, and it's, something that needs to uh, tackle a lot of different areas. So we obviously couldn't do justice to it. The book is very short, um, but we just, just wanted to sort of bring the, that perspective um, to a few areas. So we talk about um, needing to take on the fossil fuel industry and really like build, um, you know, take on the, the power of the fossil fuel industry and, and treat them, I think, as, as the enemies that they are um, and some ways to do that and to think about that. Um, we talk about building a low carbon labor movement and how um, important that is and how to think about green jobs um, both in, in the context of things like a job guarantee, but also expanding our vision of green jobs to think about things um, like care work and other kinds of work that are low carbon and improve people's lives in low carbon ways. Um, we talk about how to change the built environment um, in ways that emphasize um, not just sort of swapping out everybody's car for an electric car um, or you know giving everyone a Tesla or whatever, but that's actually about remaking the built environment so that um, people can live in, um, you know, in affordable and uh, public housing and, and dense walkable areas, can use public transportation to get around how we can actually sort of, um, you know, remake the, the actual infrastructure of our lives in ways that make it possible to live a good life, um, again, in low carbon ways. Um, and we talk about uh, how to bring um, the international into the picture, not just through the kinds of like, um, UN climate talks, which is usually the way we think about international climate action, but how to think about um, the networks of the supply chains that um, that go into things like uh, electric vehicles and green tech. And Avi might talk about this a bit more, but we um, look at lithium mining uh, and how that is another important site of how we are going to, uh, you know, 
um, that's that's also where the Green New Deal is happening, right? That the Green New Deal is not just a domestic policy. Every domestic policy also has international implications. And so we need to be thinking about those and how we can build an international um, international list Green New Deal. So um, I'm not gonna go into detail about all of this because I know I only have a couple minutes, but I just wanna say, um, that we were, you know, we were writing this thinking about, um, thinking about sort of, uh, you know, both looking at the, we were excited about the Green New Resolution, um, hoping we'd be in a different place with regards to, um, you know, our presidential candidate and, and all of that and, and to the attention that, um, uh, the possibility of, of going into, um, you know, the election cycle. I mean, it wasn't only about the election cycle, but obviously if you had somebody like a Bernie Sanders, um, it would be a really exciting like champion for a public investment strategy. Um, the fact that that's not the case, I don't think, um, obviously you can't, you know, we're not putting everything on like one person. Um, and, you know, we are sort of paradoxically, even though, um, you know, we're in a, in a, in a very different situation, I think the case for the Green New Deal is just stronger than ever. Um, you know, we really, uh, we already have seen a huge amount of spending, um, you know, the recovery uh, bill that was passed <laughs> several months ago um, was $2 trillion, which is more than Joe Biden's entire climate program. Um, so we're going to be seeing a lot more, um, recovery spending, stimulus spending, we really think that that should be going into um, the kinds of, uh, you know, Green New Deal programs and um, uh, th ways that are trying to tackle both carbon and inequality at the same time. Um, this is a really important moment to do that, um, to be meeting people's needs at a time when a lot of people have really serious needs. Um, our section on the, uh, the fossil fuel um, the need to take on the fossil fuel industry starts out with the California fires of 2018. Of course, we've seen that repeat. We're going to continue to see that repeat. That's, you know, some of these things are <laughs> moments in time that are, this is the new normal, the new reality. Um, you know, we talk about care work and obviously care work has been recognized newly as an essential, you know, essential labor, even if care workers are often not treated as if they're essential laborers. Um, and in many other aspects, I think, um, you know, a lot of the things that we were talking about and thinking about, thinking about are um, really at the center of discussion now and um, are things that I think we really need to be, to be pushing on and um, looking uh, to how we can address the coronavirus crisis, which is itself, you know, a crisis of, of public health access, of sort of the shifting human nature interface around the world of, um, you know, many of the same dynamics that produce climate change um, and, and try to really take that seriously as, as a moment to, to um, not just, um, you know, try to take things back to the way they were, but try to look to the future and, and really um, start to remake the world and we know the ways we know we need to remake it. So with that, I will um, stop and let Avi take over. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, I advise everyone to check out The Planet to Win. It's a really fantastic book. Um, also, I just want to say um, it's really inspiring for me as a young person to see other people, other young people really leading this radical paradigm shift on climate in the country. So uh, yeah, I just want to say that. Um, and yeah, no. So next is Professor Chomsky. So take it away. Thank you. Um, and thanks to both Noel and Alyssa for um, the great introductions. And so I'm coming to this discussion from the perspective of a Latin Americanist. Um, I study Latin America and um, have spent most of my life doing that. And um, in particular, uh, subsistence societies in Latin America, and that is people who basically live off of the land and produce what they consume themselves, people who live outside of sort of the capitalist export system. Um, and looking at how they've been affected by uh, economic development, especially in the 19th and 20th centuries, because the solution that the United States has always brought to poverty in Latin America has been economic development. Um, and you know, way before I started thinking about climate change, um, I was thinking about the problems with this idea of economic development in that when you see how it works in Latin America, what it ends up doing is destroying subsistence societies, um, which are also ecologically sustainable societies because instead of um, consuming things from all over the world, they just consume what they produce themselves and continue to produce and have a vested interest in continuing to produce in a sustainable manner. 
Um, instead, they're drawn into these export economies where they're working on big plantations that are uh, using lots of pesticides and fertilizers and imports and deforestation and um, that economic development really has not helped poor people in Latin America. Instead, it has dispossessed poor people and at the same time been really environmentally destructive. So um, I have to say I was really excited when this book came out. Um, to see the framing of what you guys call a radical Green New Deal um, that really takes into account, because um, as both of you were saying, um, the Green New Deal in a way is so amorphous, it could be taken in many different directions. And I feel like the non-radical Green New Deal um, wants, to pour, wants to stay within this paradigm of economic growth and economic development in the United States. And we're just going to do it by exploiting the third world still more. And unfortunately, if you look at the history of climate policies, um, a lot of them have in fact worked in that direction. Um, so just for example, in the coal mining region where I work in Colombia, when the Clean Air Act is passed in the United States in the beginning of the 1970s, forcing power plants like our power plant here in Salem to clean up their emissions, what do the companies do? They start looking for other sources of coal instead of investing in the technology that they need to clean up or to stop burning coal altogether. Um, instead, they go to Colombia. They go to a really remote region that's inhabited by indigenous, indigenous and Afro-Colombian subsistence societies, and they start moving all the people off so that they can mine coal in Colombia. Um, in Colombia, they don't have to observe the same environmental regulations. So what and so what they're basically doing is destroying another area of the world and destroying some of the few actually environmentally sustainable societies in the world. Um, to comply to make our air cleaner here. So I'm really concerned that when we talk about a Green New Deal, and this was one of the reasons why the radical Green New Deal seems so important to me, that we do question some of these larger paradigms of economic development and what it means for the environment and not keep ourselves in a narrow nationalist vision that says, oh, well, we can make things better here by making things worse in other places. Um, so I want to talk about this a little bit from the perspective of a debate that you often hear inside the United States when you talk about environmental regulation, which is jobs versus the environment. Um, so what happens if we say, well, we can't burn coal anymore? Um, uh, what happens to the people who mine the coal? Um, and we see this, this jobs versus environment um, dilemma debate come up with, say, um, pipeline construction, where environmental organizations and frequently indigenous organizations and community organizations um, oppose pipelines. And um, labor unions support building the pipelines because that's where they get their jobs. Um, and so there's a couple of things when we talk about jobs versus environment or the labor movement and how can the labor movement become part of a vision that actually says, well, we have to actually consume less here. Um, it's not just a question of changing fuels, um, of outsourcing our dirty stuff so that we can do more clean stuff here, of just creating more jobs, um, consuming more, um, but thinking about what kind of jobs we do, and Alyssa mentioned the care economy, that is many of the jobs that we associate the labor movement with, like the automobile industry, the steel industry, the mining industry, are simply dis environmentally destructive industries. And no matter how much we reform them and how much we try to change fuels, we are taking resources out of the earth and uh, and causing pollution and causing climate change, and not just climate change, but I think um, implicit in this idea of a radical Green New Deal is that 
carbon emissions are only one of the planetary crises that our overconsumption is causing. That is, there's planetary boundaries in terms of water, in terms of ozone, in terms of all kinds of different areas that the more we produce and consume, the more we are basically taking materials out of the earth and causing pollution and causing waste. So um, one thing that really fascinates me is the way to think about these conflicts from thinking about a radical Green New Deal and questioning the entire model of economic development. Um, thinking that jobs don't necessarily have to be based on production and consumption. And this is where the care economy, essential workers um, who actually work in things like childcare, education, healthcare, that do not rely on simply extracting resources and processing them so that people can buy things and consume more. Um, that a degrowth paradigm, if we question the concept of economic development, if we question the concept of economic growth and say that instead of just growing to produce and consume more so that rich people can make more profits, um, the economy should really be rethought to be based on human needs. Um, and that rather than just trying to find other kinds of production and consumption work, we should be focusing on the kinds of essential work that actually fulfill real human needs and in a way make us look more like the subsistence societies that we're destroying in order to support our overconsumption. I'll leave you there. All right, thank you so much, Professor Chomsky. Um, you know what I really love about this panel is that we have three different, very different perspectives, I'd say. Um, normally when you see a climate panel, you see kind of three of this, you know, same kind of voices, but but ours is, is really special in that it's very um, diverse and varied. Um, so now we're going to move on to the questions portion of the event. Um, so I'm going to do these in sort of a roundtable format. So I'm just going to, to say a question and then any of you can sort of pick it if you want, or if you think that one of the other panelists would be really good at answering that question, you can defer to them as well. Um, I'm also going to try and keep the, the discussion to five minutes per question, just because we have quite a few questions and we want to get them all done. Alrighty. Um, so the first question is, one of the most widespread criticisms leveled at the Green New Deal is the cost. Both conservatives on the right and centrist Democrats in the middle often question how we will pay for it. How would you respond to these criticisms? And anyone can go. I can take that. Um, seems I've just worked on it. Um, so uh, Congress approved a $2.2 trillion coronavirus aid, aid package, um, the lar largest in US modern history. Um, and all of a sudden, the how will you pay for a question kind of fizzled out a little bit. Um, I would say that paying for the Green New Deal is actually easy. The challenge is the political will. Um, we can pay for the Green New Deal the same way we paid for COVID aid package, the same way we paid for US military budgets, foreign wars, or Trump's um, $2.3 trillion tax bill. Um, Congress can authorize the necessary spending and the Treasury can spend it. Um, within the COVID aid package, importantly, there was no pay -fers, as in there was no offsets to make it deficit neutral. Um, and many economists, including mainstream economists, no longer see rising debt as a problem in the same way they used to. Um, the debt obsession has been carefully debunked at this point. Um, high public debt has not led to rising interest rates. And this is something that Ray Galvin and myself looked at when we examined Bernie Sanders' um, $16.3 trillion um, Green New Deal. Um, so at this point in history, it's important to move past this deficit phobia and austerity politics, and we have to reorientate the public purse um, uh, to work on the impacts of climate change. Um, and, and importantly, and, and finally, I would say that um, Republicans uh, use this pretense to say that they care about fiscal responsibility and deficits, and they do this to engage in economic sabotage as long as there's a Democrat in the White House, and they abandon it uh, once a Republican is in power. So over the coming weeks, uh, we're more than likely going to see Republicans change their tune on um, fiscal deficits. Uh, Melissa or Avi, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, can I just add something? Yeah. Um, I mean, 
I think there's when when people talk about how can we pay for it, um, and and what's going to happen to the deficit, uh, that there's also like two different ways that we can look at that. So one is that it's gonna pay for itself because it's gonna bring about more economic growth, government spend, and this is like the traditional Keynesian uh, 1930s New Deal uh, approach that we're gonna like restart the economy and then there'll be more spending. So there'll be more production, more consumption, more taxes, and that's how we're gonna pay for it in the end. Um, but there's also a contrary view, which comes from the degrowth perspective, that we can't just keep producing and consuming more, that that's the root of the problem and that and this also connects to the third world perspective that it really has to be through redistribution that it's paid for. That is, and this is why uh, it goes along with um, suggestions for radically changing our tax structure. That is, we need to tax the corporations, we need to tax the rich, that that's where the, um, the money needs to come from, not from the idea that we're going to like jumpstart the economy and, and just get more taxes by producing and consuming more. Um, it's redistributive and it's also redistributive at a global level um, because um, I think it's really important that, that we keep in mind that we can't just have a Green New Deal here uh, and think that, oh, well, we're all going to get more stuff here. It's just gonna be greener by extracting more from the third world. That is the redistribution really has to happen on a global level too. Right, thank you. All right, um, we'll, move on to we'll move on to questions. Thing. Oh, well, Lisa, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I mean, no, no I totally agree with everything that Noel and Avi have said in terms of like, there's both, it's both I think there's many sources of money from taxes to low interest rates. So it's just, it's not a real question. And also like, we really do need to think of it as a redistributive thing. But I think there's also another way of thinking about as, as I was saying, how the, the question of how do you pay for it? And there's a question of, well, that there's no, there's no question of how you pay for it. It's, it's, or, or I guess that it's like, you're going to pay for it one way or another. It's going to be, you know, fire response, like disaster response, um, dealing with the effects of climate change, um, that like health effects, um, the ways that it's going to actually be impacting our lives as we are seeing. Um, it's here, it has been here, it's going to continue um, to intensify. And it, there's no world in which we're not spending money on climate change. There's just a way in which we do it like retroactively um, and one in which we try to start actually tackling it at the root in ways that are, as we've been saying, sort of um, also tackling um, other interrelated uh, social and economic problems. Awesome, thank you. All right, so we are gonna move on to question two. Um, so the concept of a just transition is central to a Green New Deal. Can any of you speak a little bit more about what exactly a just transition is and maybe give some of examples of what a just transition might look like either on a national or international level? Um, I'm happy to start off that one. Um, so the just transition is a framework that comes out of sort of labor and environmental thinking um, around how workers in um, extractive industries or other environmentally or socially harmful industries can, um, you know, be uh, how we can make a transition away from those industries or close down those industries without making workers pay for it. Um, since we need to recognize that workers aren't in control of their industries, um, it's the bosses who are sort of deciding how they're investing in what those industries are. And, and we need people who are in those industries who, to be able to um, to make a living, um, to to you know survive after um, that industry winds down, and so how can we do that? Um, and there's been a lot of um, ways of thinking about that, but um, a lot of you know the idea of of things like green jobs programs. Um, which I think are the most robust version. Sometimes you see it watered down into like jobs training or things like that, that are just about, you can train people and then they can go find a job. But I think, well, what if, if there aren't jobs out there? Um, I think things like, um, you know, state spending and, and public jobs programs are really crucial to actually make sure, sure that transition happens um, and that people have a place to land after their industry winds down. Um, and this developed out of um, both uh, some workers in fossil fuels, but also in um, atomic and chemical industries. Um, but I think that a lot of the ideas that they had are really relevant to today. And I think we're actually in a really good moment to start um, implementing some of the just transition ideas, which again, have been around for a long time, um, but have never fully been implemented in part because I think workers are 
um, often distrustful of the green jobs framework because they don't see it. Like it's it's a thing people talk about, but it hasn't really materialized. And so like, I think it's reasonable that, that people um, whose industries are likely to be affected would be skeptical about like the promise of the green job. Like, you know, a job in the hand is better than two green jobs, like in the, you know, Green New Deal, like, website or whatever so um so i think we need to recognize that but right now we are in the midst again you know of a massive jobs crisis um a ton a huge number of people are out of work including many people in extractive industries um the you know oil and gas price crash that happened when everyone stopped like flying everywhere um when people stopped driving as much when people stopped traveling as much all of which are things that are good in some ways, but also put a lot of people out of work because oil prices crashed. A lot of things were not um, economically viable, especially fracking in the US, which is, um, you know, you need to have a high price uh, of oil to, to make that profitable. So, um, so a bunch of folks are out of work, both in the US and around the world. And I think this is actually a really good time <laughs> to start like doing some proof of concept of the green jobs um, idea and say like, look, people are out of work um, who have been in these industries. We, rather than, um, you know, saying we're going to like turbocharge this industry again or like throw more subsidies at it or like prop up industries that we know should shut down um, from extractive industry to like the cruise ship industry to all of these these really resource consumptive things. Um, why not say, you know, we also know we need to start doing a lot of this, um, uh, you know, public infrastructure building, um, green energy build out, uh, you know, care work teaching all of these things that we actually we can we can start spending on um, and putting people into that kind of work now and and show that like there actually is some place for them and and there is going to be like a um, you know that there's um, some stability that can come even as we're proposing changing everything around us and I think that idea that you can that you can like that there will be <laughs> something you can count on um, in terms of um, you know being able to to um, you know, to have access to the things you need to, um, especially in a, in a country like the US where things like healthcare are tied to your work, um, often not for everyone, because everyone's work gives them healthcare. But in any case, we need to make sure that there's, that there is some, um, you know, uh, I think promise of, of possibility and stability through a lot of turmoil. Um, and I think it's a very, very good time to do that um, because we are already <laughs> in the crisis, um, which was not a Green New Deal, um, you know, instigated or climate instigated. But, um, you know, this is also something that's happened with other industries like coal miners, um, you know, have been, uh, as coal has been um, becoming economically unviable and um, coal plants have been shut down, uh, you know, a lot of coal miners are out of work and have been um, not because necessarily like the climate, the state has stepped in to do climate action, but because of other um, both political and economic circumstances. And so there's a lot of, I guess the point is um, capitalist economies are tumultuous. <laughs> People get thrown out of work a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, we only talk about that being a problem when it's like an intentional, like we are going to shut down this industry and try to do something else instead. And when it's just like the market that shuts down an industry, those people are on their own. So I think we can do better than that. And now is a good time to do that. Um, so yeah, I don't know, maybe Noel obvious need to add. Um, I just wanted to expand a little bit because you know you mentioned healthcare and pensions and like what people lose when they lose their jobs. Um, I think part of the idea of the just transition is making people less dependent on their jobs as well. Um, because if we lived in a society, an economy that prioritized basic human needs, um, those things shouldn't be connected to a job. Things, basic human needs like food and shelter and healthcare and and uh, elder care and and pensions, those should be guaranteed by society. Um, so that rather than thinking of the just transition of like just finding another job that's going to do the same thing, um, I think we're talking about a, a more radical economic transition that is going to um, to put a lot in terms of prioritizing human needs, taking them out of the market altogether and, and putting them into what we consider to be basic human rights. All right, thank you, Willis and Avi. Uh, Professor, do you wanna add anything before we move on? Uh, yeah, just briefly, um, in terms of a radical Green New Deal, I think a guaranteed healthcare, Medicare for all is a central component. Um, and, and that's why it's included to give uh, workers confidence that they can unlink um, their healthcare from their job. And also, uh, finally, um, 
a just transition also can be a selling point. If you look at Sunrise Movement for uh, Mike Siegel, who's running for a house seat in Texas, um, this exemplifies how a just transition can bring voters on board by uh, emphasizing how it will take care of, of, of workers in the process. Awesome, thank you. I think uh, one green job in the hand and two versus two in the website is gonna be a pretty awesome quote to come out of that conversation. Um, all right, move on to question three. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic has affected every aspect of our lives and now solving the crisis has become almost the sole political focus of our government. How has COVID affected the movement for the Green New Deal? Has it made it more difficult or has it created any new opportunities? And anyone can just go right ahead. Um, I can go after this. Um, I, I guess the, the pandemic has exposed, yeah, as you said, many cracks in the economic system. Uh, before COVID, we we're already facing multiple crises, climate emergency, grotesque inequality, systematic racism. Um, but what are the roots of all these causes? Are, are the roots, or what are the root causes? Um, well, you have neoliberal economics, austerity politics, deregulation, corporate monopolies, and unequal distributions of, of power and wealth. And these all have to be upended. Um, COVID actually allows us to harness um, the disruptive forces of the pandemic to accelerate the decline of the fossil fuel industry and institute an economy that, that works for all, to, to paraphrase Bernie. Um, on, a, on a positive note, the pandemic has accelerated the mainstream uh, mainstreaming of marginal ideas. Um, the fact that radical anti-austerity measures are, are now advocated by newspapers like the Financial Times or even the IMF in the last few days has come out taking a stand against austerity. Um, and even pre-COVID polls showed that there was a significant support for a wealth tax with over 70% support across party lines. So in many ways, this can be seen as an opportunity to transform economies and societies in, in radically positive directions. Yeah, I'll, um, sort of jump on that. I mean, I think I agree with what Noel said, and I think you know it's interesting because in the in Planet to Win, we talk about sort of how we imagine some of the things that we're talking about happening, and like some of them may seem really far, but like we also think we need to like there are moments when you know in politics there's both like moments of kind of like everyday grind, and it feels like everything is so far away, and then there are these like crisis moments when everything is like changing, and kind of there are both um, <laughs> really intense challenges and, and sort of threats, and but also opportunities to to like start to rethink and remake. Um, to remake uh, what's possible. Um, and so we talked about that kind of in the abstract and we had a critique of like Obama's um, response to the 2008 financial crash and like his stimulus program, which we think really <laughs> could have gone a lot further than it did. Um, but, um, you know, we weren't obviously thinking about kind of like the kind of crisis situation we're entering into. Um, but I do think that the, the sort of point remains like we are going to need to, to um, any any kind of like massive social transformation program um, is going to have to like proceed through moments of, um, you know, where, where things are sort of more up in the air. And um, again, like capitalist systems are <laughs> prone to periodic crises. And those are often moments of a lot of um, political change, um, not always. I think 2008 actually um, resulted in, at the time, remarkably little change, but it also produced a lot of uh, political turmoil that we're still living with and will continue to live with. Um, the present, you know, I think the coronavirus um, crisis and the and the sort of economic crisis that is um, sort of following on it um, are also going to have very long lasting repercussions politically. Um, and I think we really need to be thinking about how to, to start tackling um, to, to learn from, um, I think, the 2008 moment. And, you know, we talk about how um, I think uh, the Obama stimulus program really tried to like avoid anything that sounded too like socialist, anything that, which, which for him meant um, nothing, I mean, even approaching like an actual socialist program, but even just like public spending on things um, like public jobs programs, like public investment. It was mostly like, how can you um, use, uh, you know, some some you know subsidies for R&D and things like that, but very oriented on just like stimulating the private sector technological development, um, and that did some you know they like that that did sort of um, I think 
uh, have some effects on, on the development of green tech and cheapening of um, green tech, but it's that's we, we can't <laughs> do that again, basically. Um, we need to really use this um, moment to, to um, to push for a much more um, wide ranging um, program that can can start to tackle um, a lot of the, the um, you know, the very, I think, deep and entrenched um, social crises that we're really seeing um, come to the fore. And I do think that can be, there's a way in which it can be harder because obviously everything, um, because COVID is like the, the number one issue, but I really, I don't think they are, um, I don't, Think it has to be like a distraction or pose this as a distraction. I think we're, you know, we're talking about how do we, um, how do we, you know, we're in a moment where the people I think are really reflecting on um, what, how our society is or is not functioning. And we need to like really, really push on that moment um, and, and try to do more with it. So I think there's, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity. There's, it's going to be very, um, you know, as Noel said, even a, a lot of sort of like mainstream, um, you know, commentators and so on who might have been hostile to things like this or maybe more open to it. But I think more importantly, um, a lot of, of um, people who are, <laughs> whose voices are not heard in like the FT or whatever, um, are seeing how, uh, you know, things are not working for them, how the system is not working for them, how even in this moment of like, you know, where people are, have been out of work for months, um, you know, can't pay rent, there's there's very little <laughs> forthcoming um, from the government to support people. So there's, I think, just like a lot of, um, there's going to be, there is and will be, I think, a lot of frustration and anger and like desire for things to be different that we should, I think, try to build on and, 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 um, you know, see as a desire for something different, which is what I think the Green New Deal is trying to promise. Awesome, all right, next question. Um, rising public outcry and protests compounding with the ongoing wildfires and hurricanes battering the country has resulted in climate now establishing itself as a politically crucial platform issue, even for some Republicans. How does Joe Biden's climate plan compare to Trump's? And if Biden becomes president, what can be done to further enhance his climate actions? No one wants to take the Biden versus Trump one. <laughs> Professor Healy, do you want to go ahead? Um, I, I can take it. Yeah, well, um, another four years of Trump is a debt nail for the planet. Um, I mean, there's no point talking about uh, Trump's climate plans because he doesn't have any except to, to further entrench us into the fossil fuel industry and, and climate chaos. Um, uh, while Biden didn't start the 2020 presidential race with a stellar um, climate plan, his new plan, is one of the most progressive climate plans of any presidential nominee in party history. Um, and he has done a good job of responding to the uh, pressure from the climate movement. Um, he, although it's, it's, it's not as strong as, as Bernie Sanders' plans or Jay Inslee's or Elizabeth Warren's, but Biden's plan um, was boosted from 1.7 trillion a year um, over 10 years to a much more substantial 2 trillion, trillion over four years with a much faster timeline to achieve a carbon-free electricity sector and a greater focus on environmental justice. And importantly, 40% of his investment in clean energy is going to be allocate, allocated to disadvantaged communities. Um, so uh, calling for 100% clean energy by 2035, create 10 million jobs, there is a lot to vote for in Biden's plan, and there is a lot to vote against in Trump's non-existent plan. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Avi or Alyssa, do you have anything? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I would just say that, um, that I think one of the most important things if Biden is elected is not to then just say, oh, thank goodness, now we've elected Biden, we can sit back because he's going to take care of things. but that in a Biden administration, there's going to be more space for pushing for the kinds of policies we need. Um, and so I signed this letter a few weeks ago that was something like, you know, we need to elect Biden and then we need to start fighting him the minute he is elected. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alyssa, do you wanna say anything? Just, I just, I just think that's completely right. And um, I also just think that that, um, you know, although Biden has sometimes sort of suggested like he's a return to the like pre-Trump era and the Obama years and things like that, I just that is not happening. <laughs> um, 
you know, we're not going to see the kinds of, um, you know, I think social movements and protests and unrest that we've seen in um, the past several years, I think just go go away because Joe Biden is president. Um, and so I think, but I think that's very exciting. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, movements like the Black Lives Matter protests this, this summer, which were the biggest, um, I have read, were the, like the biggest um, in terms of like how many people participated in them movements in American history um, are really, uh, you know, are very exciting and those sorts of things I think are going to continue <laughs> as long as we, um, you know, have live in a country that is so, permeated by racism and its effects on people's lives. I think we're going to see, um, you know, I think many other forms of, um, you know, whatever. Biden's not putting the genie of sort of like uh, <laughs> political unrest back in the bottle and he may want to, but I, I, um, I think it's just how can we actually like uh, think about that in like systematic ways, so. Awesome, I know from uh, my perspective with Sunrise, we're always talking about how let's elect Biden and then let's get to work. Uh, let's really get him going on climate uh, the way that we want to and not the way that, uh, you know, centrists or, or the right might want to. Um, all right, so that lead, that's a pretty good transition to our next question. And depending on how long this one runs, it might be our last one. Um, so what is the role of electoral politics for the future of the Green New Deal? And how can the youth or the general public engage in this work? I can start off. Um, I mean, I think that the future of like electoral politics in the Green New Deal is, um, as with kind of all other political things, we need to happen one piece of a, a larger puzzle, I guess, and that it's, I think is really important. Um, and I've been very heartened to see a lot of um, uh, state and local level um, or congressional candidates also, um, uh, folks like Jamal Bowman, who are Green New Deal supporters um, at the state level, people like Nikhil Saval in uh, Pennsylvania, who is fighting for a Green New Deal in Pennsylvania, which is a, you know important in a, in a state that is so, um, that is a major fossil fuel <laughs> industry state. Um, so we've seen a lot of successes at, those are just two examples of many candidates who've been running at state and local level um, Green New Deal programs and I think that's really exciting and great and people who are also sort of like on the more general like I would say it's sort of like Bernie Kratt <laughs> agenda of um, you know trying to take on um, uh, some of aspects of like the Bernie program um, through at different levels but you know electoral politics is never going to be the only thing and um, I think uh, uh, many other movements from Sunrise, the movement for Black Lives, to many other aspects of sort of, um, of, of the social movements that I think are building and have continued to build. Um, we, we need to see those as sort of like in conversation and not, sometimes I think on the left people can frame those like antagonistic, where it's like you're in the streets or you're like in office. And I think we really, you know, I tend to think of them as like intertwined and sort of like co-producing more energy and pushing from different angles. So it's like, how can we build those um, in ways that are, um, you know, where, where people who are like movement candidates are held accountable to movements, um, where movements are like, I mean, you know, sometimes movements are, are not affiliated with um, electoral politics at all. And I think that's great too. So basically I think it takes all kinds of things and we need to be doing all kinds of things. So, uh, and young people um, can get involved in many ways, but maybe I'll let Avi or Noel will say more about that because I've already um, just said a bunch. I guess what I would just add is like right now, all eyes are focused on the presidential election, right? But um, that electoral politics goes way beyond that too. And, you know, getting the, the squad of um, radical representatives uh, in, in the House has made a huge difference to the entire debate. I mean, Ed Markey has been in Congress forever, right? And he has sponsored environmental legislation that has been like, very centrist, very right within the mainstream. Um, but having Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez there, and of course the movements in the streets that, that Alyssa was just talking about too. But I think without her presence there, he never would have been drawn in to designing a, a Green New Deal either. So so electoral politics is important on, a, on th that we don't just get so obsessed with the presidential election, but think about all different levels too. All right, awesome. Professor Healy, do you want to say anything or? No? Okay. All right, we'll probably do one more question really quick and then we'll wrap up. Um, so, so you've all been in the climate change fight uh, for some time. So what is currently giving you hope in the current climate movement? And does the Green New Deal sort of provide hope 
um, to people because I know I know that the climate movement can kind of be seen as a as a desperate battle sometimes. But what, what what's giving you hope currently? So I'll start. Um, you know, as I was saying, I I do a lot of work in Colombia, and um, the people who are fighting against the coal mine in Colombia are some of the poorest and most marginalized people in the world. Um, they live in places where there's no water, there's no electricity, there's no health care, there's no schools. They, they just have nothing. Um, and when we go to Colombia, they never wonder what they can do. It's one of the most mobilized places I've ever been in. Um, People are out in the streets, there's civic strikes, there's organizing this and organizing that and communal this and collective that and uh, you know land repossessions and it's just completely ongoing. And like every couple of weeks we get letters from people there saying, you know, you have to support this activity, you have to help us support that activity. We don't even have time to support all the activities that are going on there. And I'm always surprised when I give, um, talks to audiences in the United States and people say, well, you know, the system is so big, it's so strong, what can we do? We don't want to know what we can do. It's like, how come people who have all the resources at their hands don't know what to do, but people who have nothing don't have any trouble figuring out what to do? But I guess I would say that um, seeing what kinds of struggles are being carried out in the third world is really what gives me the most hope. I can go if, um, um, yeah, so uh, tagging on from Avi's comment there, <clears throat> I think it's really important that we break out of this responsible political discourse that has constrained um, liberals for a very long time. You can see, um, you know, people like Marky, AOC, as, as Avi said, the squad, um, how far they have changed uh, politics and changed the, the politics of, of possibility. Um, uh, climate change is the depressing subject, but the Green New Deal um, and a radical Green New Deal gives me a lot of hope. Um, I uh, to think that um, the next administration um, would not leave markets um, uh, to to um, solve the climate crisis. Um, uh, that gives me hope. It gives me hope if um, the next administration view uh, emissions reductions as a delete as a deeply political project, that structural change has to be managed, the federal government has to come in, we have to phase out fossil fuels and technologies, we need targeted in interventions, um, and we also need massive uh, deficit spending, taking into account also the, the comments that, um, that Abby said, and uh, along with that we can also um, there is a lot of support around uh, uh, things like a, a wealth tax. We can tax people's power, even though we're not, uh, 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 we, we don't necessarily need that to, to deficit spend. So I think the Green New Deal has, has given me a lot of hope and certainly a lot of the writings of Alyssa and, and her cohort uh, for A Planet to Win has been really visionary in, in forcing people to think about the, the previously unimagined. Well, thank you, Noel. That is really, that makes me feel good to hear. Um, so I know, you know, I definitely think, um, you know, as, as you're saying, climate can be a really, it can be really hard to work on it all the time because you do feel, it can feel pretty bleak sometimes, but um, I really do think a lot is possible and, um, you know, the vision, I really think a much better world is, is possible, whether we will get to it is another question, but it is, um, you know, I think some of the tragic choices that are sometimes posed around climate that like not everyone can like live well or that it's this kind of like, um, you know, that there's not enough for everyone is just not true. Um, there's not everyone enough for everyone to live um, like some of the most like profligate American consumers, but we don't need that. And I think that is not what, you know, makes for a good life. So I think we need to think about, you know, I think really, really thinking about how we want our lives to be um, can be a source of inspiration. Um, but more, I guess, um, the thing that I think often gives me the most hope 
um, I guess two things. One, one of them is like working on stuff. Cause I think when you're just like thinking about it all, it just feels really overwhelming. It's sort of to Avi's point, like once you start getting out there and doing stuff, you have to start figuring out problems. And like in the times of my life and I've been actively organizing um, political struggles, I feel much more hopeful um, than times when I'm not, not because I don't, I mean, I often understand what the challenges are even better and more deeply, but you are, you're like constantly trying to figure, okay, what are we doing now? What are we doing now? How do we, you're not just giving up. You're like, how do we get around this problem? Like your whole job as it were is to like figure out like new plans, new strategies, new ways of like trying to, to deal with the challenges you face and, and to get to the goals you want to reach. So I think like practical activity um, and like getting involved in struggles is like really crucial for having hope. Um, and the other thing that gives me hope is, is just like not knowing what's gonna happen in a way. Like, and that, that sounds a little weird because sometimes like things that you don't know are gonna happen can be really bad. Like um, a global pandemic that I did not know was going to happen even though, you know, obviously people have warned about that for a long time. So it's not like nobody could know, but, um, but, but um, there's also just, you know, I think realizing that um, there are so many people who are engaged in struggles around the world that I don't know everything about and I may not know about it at all. And then suddenly you hear about them um, because something is happening or that's bursting into like your consciousness for some reason or as we saw this summer um, you know I was feeling like incredibly hopeless in like May um, and then all of a sudden we had these like massive um, you know these like massive public protests and um, this like huge uprising um, that I was really not expecting to happen um, and it was obviously you know you can't say that's just a hopeful event because it's obviously precipitated by a terrible one um, the death of George Floyd but there's also you know that there is this um, um, there is there's a lot of possibility that I think sometimes I when when I'm feeling bad about how like little is possible I'm I'm like not realizing all the ways that um, or I you know I can I can shut down like what I think is possible when actually much more is happening could happen and the fact that I'm not like there involved in it or like doing that work doesn't mean that other people aren't so that can also be a spur to be like okay like you know, not, and that doesn't mean that you should just be like, oh, well, somebody's taking care of this. Cause I think sometimes that's people's like default climate response. And especially sometimes around sunrise, like, oh, the young people will take care of it or something, which is not what I would like to suggest. So pair that kind of like, you know, there's, there's stuff happening in the world that I don't know about. And then how can I start doing stuff here? So we can like link up when those moments of like huge massive protest or like possibility happen, how can like, I be ready to go out and do my part um, while also doing that like daily in and out work um, that is like absolutely crucial and essential. So um, those are it for me, I'd say. Awesome, thank you so much. And I know briefly something that gives me hope is uh, events like this, you know, really robust and thoughtful conversations about a policy that I fight for, you know, in the streets or, or whom, uh, however with Sunrise. And it's just really awesome to, uh, to be able to engage with everyone on this. Um, I also wanna thank the panelists. We're, we're past 5.30 a little bit right now. Um, so I am going to throw up, I'm gonna screen share and throw up a little panel on voting. Um, and Professor Healy, if you wanted to say anything before we ended. Uh, just a shout out to Salem State to thanks, uh, thanking them for organizing this and also Salem State divested from fossil fuels two years ago and uh, I, I just want to acknowledge that the university, um, acknowledge university for, for, for doing that and, and, and getting involved in, in climate politics or movements whether it's divestment movements or Black Lives Matter movements and collective action, I mean that's, that's what we have to do. Awesome, thank you. Um, and everyone can see the, the little voting square right here. Um, just one thing I wanted to highlight, um, if you are planning on registering to vote by mail, the application deadline in mass is actually tonight. So um, right after this event, go onto the website and uh, request your mail-in application if you choose to do so. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful event and thank you panelists and thank you to the audience. <laughs>